All right. Are you, uh, Jim, you're able to hear me? I hear you. Great. Great. So I assume everyone else can hear as well. So let's get started. Um, I see some folks are filtering in, so we'll kind of we'll start with some quick introductions. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to presenting our second webinar topic for everybody here. Uh, for this webinar, we will provide a complete overview of our Pulsa hardware and software solution. Uh, as a quick introduction, my name is Sam Patui. This is this guy up here. Uh, and I had business development at Pulsa. I'm also joined here by um, our sales manager, uh, Jamie Kogel. Uh, before jumping into the session, I'd like to note that this is a second in a series of three planned webinars over the three weeks. Uh, the first webinar focused on optimizing end-to-end -end operations with Pulsa. In that session, we provide an overview of all types of telemetry across bulk and packaged gases and describe the series of technical, operational, and financial improvements that we have implemented to enable telemetry to work across all access, access, asset types, excuse me, not just bulk tanks. You can view the video at the link in this presentation. It's also been shared in our newsletter and I'll also share it afterwards with all attendees. After this webinar, we'll all send you a video link with the webinar content, slide content, and links to register for upcoming webinars. Uh, this webinar, we're, we're basically planning on um, conducting for about 20 minutes and leaving about five to 10 minutes open at the end for questions, which we can extend if necessary. Next week, we'll be conducting one on the business case for using Pulsa. A very common thing that we hear from customers and distributors is that they really enjoy the technology but don't know how to make a business case for deploying it. And this session will go through really how Pulse can be used as a powerful tool to significantly increase profitability for both, let's say, distributors and end customers, but heavily for distributors. And a phased approach for how to get started with deploying the platform. And all automatically after the end of the session, make sure that everyone who is registered for this webinar will be registered for next week as well. Uh, for now, those are the webinars we have on the calendar, but depending on the business climate over the next couple of weeks and months, we might schedule some more sessions, and we're definitely open to hearing from everybody here if there are certain sessions that you are more interested in. And I'd also like to know if your team would like to have a private webinar with your sales, ops, similar folks, uh, we can, and questions specific for your group, please reach out and we'll get something going on the calendar. Now let's get into today's content. Uh, for today, I'll start with a description of our hardware platform and our hardware sensors and where they can be used. Uh, then I'll go into an overview of how our wireless, wireless hardware communicates with our cloud services. And after that, I'll go into our software solution, showing how the interface looks to view and how to add sensors. And I'll leave some time open at the end for Q&A. All right, so let's jump into the hardware. So here's a quick overview of all our sensors, and I will go into significantly more detail uh, for all these sensors in the coming slides. We have really at a high level, we have a differential pressure sensor for measuring levels of large bulk tanks, two weight-based sensors to measure weight, and a high pressure sensor for pressurized assets. I'll go into more detail about every sensor, but at a high level, these sensors, sensors send, and uh, you will receive roughly 500 readings a day for close to real-time uh, visibility of your remote assets. I say roughly because it's exactly one reading every three minutes, which is very close to 500 readings a day. All sensors are completely wireless, have a five to seven year battery life, and will proactively notify you when the sensor is running low of battery. The batteries are all easily and cheap, cheaply replaceable uh, with a pressure sensor using a CR2032 watch battery uh, that is often found in watches, of course, watch battery. And the weight sensors use a 3.6 volt battery, which is about the same size as a AA battery. Uh, both batteries are commonly found off the shelf, uh, and they usually cost less than a buck to replace. Uh, next up, I'd like to go into more sense, each sensor in detail and talk about how the wireless connectivity works. So here is our Pulsa differential pressure sensor. You can see this in my hand here. This is how the sensor looks. Uh, as you can tell, it fits within the palm of your hand. Uh, it's a very small piece of wireless hardware. Uh, when folks typically, actually, when the term telemetry comes up, I would imagine that 90% of the folks on the call are thinking about the problems that this sensor is aiming to solve. Uh, we've built something though that's completely unique from what's existing in the industry today. There's no wires. You can see this sensor is sending readings in my hand. It's sending zero PSI, but it's sending readings. Uh, there's no cable. And uh, like all sensors, you're getting 500 readings a day for close to real-time visibility of your remote asset. Uh, what this means is that you have significantly simpler bulk installation. Rather than complex cabling and wiring, of a complex and, and bulk telemetry setup, no pun intended, 
All you need to do is plumb a tiny sensor that fits within really the palm of your hand. Our customers have informed us that installations with our differential pressure sensor take about you know, 70 to 80% less time than that of what's in the com competition today. Uh, you can easily get the sensor set up 15, minutes, 15 to 20 minutes all in without calling us. There's no network provisioning or anything like that. You can set it up on your own at your site as you see fit, whenever at your time and at your leisure. Uh, and that 15 to 20 minutes can include software, hardware, network access. The first one might take a little bit longer because you're trying to figure out what the software means and what we're asking for in software. But we can, I mean, usually most of the time is spent actually plumbing the sensor and software and everything like that. Network connectivity is basically minutes. Uh, the sensors are weatherproof. Um, and outside the box, they support, this sensor supports uh, 35 feet of height in the tank, 420 inches. And we can easily get sensors up to 70 feet tall uh, by request. Uh, and in a single view, you can monitor the headspace for your differential pressure setup as well. Uh, the two pictures you see here consist of insulation on like a micro bulk slash bulk tank on the top um, and one on a Siltec Titan Dewar at the bottom. Micro bulk business across the country is booming and we're seeing many installations of our sensors on micro bulk tanks. Um, and we're also seeing a good amount of interest for a solution on various types of doers as well. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. One of the nice things is we do have a partnership with Siltec. So if you're purchasing any tanks from them, uh, they will automatically fit and plumb uh, your telemetry setup so you get it right out of the box when it's delivered to you. Our next sensor I'd like to go into is our very popular industrial scale. Uh, this is a solution that didn't exist until we released it, and we started to see folks deploy it really across their entire enterprise. Uh, the economics just work. I mean, similar to what you've probably been very familiar with on your bulk tank differential pressure sensors, uh, the economics, I mean, are cost of significantly less across everything, but now we've gone to a point where it doesn't make sense not to put it on your, um, your, your doers as well. And now it's really just a no-brainer to install it anywhere where you have cryogenic cylinders. For this sensor, it can actually handle an 8,000 pound point load out of the box. I mean, software, we limit that to 1,500 pounds just for increased precision, but we can support larger sizes if your deployment requires it. Uh, there's two options, a uh, two-foot by two-foot version and a three-foot by three-foot version uh, with uh, ramps available for both. And there's also adjustable feet available for uneven surfaces. Each component, including the scales and the ramps, weighs somewhere between eight, 60 to 80 pounds. And uh, you can easily configure the sensor to account for the tear weight for your container. So all you're actually measuring is the weight of the product inside your tank. Uh, I would say I did 70 to 80 percent of our use cases on this product today are cryogenic cylinders, which you know we're talking about up to 500 liters or so. So pretty much any of your what you call doers, cryogenic cylinders, so forth, uh, which you know that's that's where most of these are being installed. We're seeing a very strong drive to automate the BevCarb CO2 supply chain, in particular with our scales, where distributors and customers have been able to reduce deliveries by roughly 50 percent. Uh, and we can, we're going to go into those numbers a lot more next week, but that's what we're starting to see where folks are really reducing the amount of time that they're, uh, that customers have to bring distributors in, vice versa, distributors have to visit customers to uh, supply them. And that's been just a huge boon for both distributors and end customers. Um, so some of our customers have been able to pick up our scale for other heavy consumables. A welding wire in particular was a very interesting use case that our customers actually came to us with. Uh, where distributors are picking it up for making sure that uh, manufacturing facilities as at a whole are keeping up with their gas, welding wire, and everything that they need at one site. Uh, that's the only sensor I actually don't have with me uh, because it's 680 pounds and I'm not that strong to hold that up with one hand in this conference. But here is our weight scale. This is our pull for weight pile. This is a uh, one foot by one foot, if you can see uh, very well in here, but it's a one foot by one foot tile. Uh, which is great for your smaller assets uh, that you can use weight to measure, like uh, liquefied gas cylinders and kegs. Our weight tile solution measures up to 260 pounds with a 1% accuracy uh, on a base that's one foot by one foot wide. Uh, one of the neat things that we designed for our weight tile solution is the ability to combine multiple platforms to support one larger base. You can combine up to 16 for a pretty large deployment. Um, we really would say the line to draw here is that if you're going above 400 pounds, move to the industrial scale. But if you're looking at less than that, uh, for a larger uh, scale deployment, this, this solution works great for that. 
then similar to our heavy duty scale, each of these tiles can compensate for a container tear weight as well. Uh, these have been very commonly used for liquefied gases. I would say that's probably most of our use cases for this, CO2, nitrous. Uh, we're seeing them heavily used for beverage customers to monitor beer kegs. Um, as you can see in kind of the imagery here, we have a uh, one sensor and scale for uh, um, a uh, manifolded setup. And then we have another uh, one just for an individual cylinder sitting at a customer's site. Uh, these are the nice thing about manifolded setups is that you'd only need actually one sensor to monitor each side. And I'll go into that a little bit more. It's very relevant for the pressure sensors. Uh, we and we also see these very heavily used uh, combined in uh, uh, dentist offices uh, for nitrous and oxygen, or, or medical offices um, or breweries for CO2 and nitrogen. And I'll talk about kind of the combination in one minute. Last but not least, we actually have the first sensor that we release in the market. Uh, that's our high pressure sensor. Uh, this sensor, like our differential pressure sensor, is made out of 316 stainless steel and Viton. It is weatherproof and can be cleaned for oxygen use, it, which is very relevant today, actually, in particular. Uh, measures up to 2,900 PSI and higher ranges can be custom ordered as well. Uh, this sensor in particular, we're seeing a very wide variety of applications for the sensor. Because it can be installed in any quarter inch MPT port, you can install it almost anywhere. Almost any specialty or lab gas is a slam dunk configuration for this product. The uh, economics and installation are ridiculously simple. We're also seeing our product widely popular on any manifolded environment. Uh, many customers are using our sensors in environments where they have a switchover. Uh, we can notify them if the pressure drops for a switchover event and that way to schedule a delivery. Uh, or they can also use this to monitor if there's anything strange going online. We've actually been able to catch leaks, problems before the customer catches them. And really, uh, distributors have been able, and customers have been able to partner and say, okay, this is a problem elsewhere. We need to fix that and get back to uh, um, actually the actual installation issue at hand. Um, and today, we're seeing very strong uh, demand for the sensor and medical application, particularly oxygen. As we know, ERs and hospitals cannot run out of oxygen and other critical gases. This solution will prevent that from happening with a system of alerts and notifications when our inventory is happening. Um, as you can see here, kind of a lot of times when people ask, how do you plummet or connect it? Uh, you can kind of see if you're doing an individual cylinder in the kind of the diagonal, the top left corner and bottom right. Um, in the bottom right, you can see it just going in line uh, where you would plug in your regulator and uh, your gauge. So the gauge off of your regulator, that's where you plumb it in with the T. Um, and the top left is where you would uh, uh, T it in just off of your CGA fitting. And the other two are just manifolded setups. So you could see kind of how you have a couple pulses sensors on each side of the manifold to notify you when things are uh, uh, going uh, in a particular, uh, going off on one side and then switching to the other side. Uh, let, now let's talk about how everything works. Um, each of these sensors I've described sends out roughly 500 readings a day. Uh, there is a device, um, and I'll talk in a lot more detail about it in a minute, uh, that sends those readings through all available cellular networks, available to, uh, to in, uh, all available cellular networks in the region to our servers. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And from her servers, you'll be able to access all of your sensor readings uh, and close to real time across our web and mobile OS-based platforms. Now, all these sensors work through the multi-network cell gateway. This is really where the magic starts. Uh, this gateway works across all mobile carriers with one piece of hardware. You don't have to tell us if you're on AT&T or Verizon or you need 4G or anything else. It just works outside the box. When this gateway boots up, it's like the best wireless carrier in the region and the best band between 4G, 3G, 2G. It picks what's best. You don't have to care. Um, there's kind of like a lot of, I'd say, either misinformation or misdirected information out in the market about cellular coverage and signals, about 2G, 3G, all that stuff going away. Uh, what is actually happening is 2G and 3G are not completely going away. What, what is phenomenal and very nice about those networks is they have a much lower frequency, so they cross across much larger bands and much bigger areas, and they can permeate walls much better. Um, and so what's happening very frequently is the T-Mobile, the at and they're bidding those off and selling that, that those regions to other rural carriers who are using that to report phone coverage in more rural areas. And so what we see is like, let's say you're sitting in this downtown of a, uh, a highly dense area, you're probably gonna pick up our gateway with 4G, uh, Verizon or at t service, 
but in rural areas, we're picking up a lot more coverage because we can you pick all these different carriers. Um, really, I think the point to be made here is you shouldn't have to care about 4G, 3G, 2G, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you shouldn't have to become a network expert. That's our job, and that's why we've engineered the device to work in the way that it, it does. Uh, the device is weatherproof and only has to be 350 feet away from your sensors. Uh, note that this works. Think about this very similar to your Wi-Fi routers, your blue speakers at home with just much more range because we've engineered it for purely one-way communication. Um, metals and concrete walls can limit your range, but it, it's essentially limiting your range. So the more you stick in between, the less of a football field that you have to communicate with. But basically, in any type of installation, we've been able to make sure that the cellular gateway uh, can communicate with the sensors in the area. Um, and we are very soon going to have an outdoor power, solar power kit available that you can use with this gateway, as well to mount uh, into the ground. It will be available very short, shortly, and we're working actually on pilots of that today. Um, and with this wireless connectivity, you can support a wide variety of different installations of different gas and sensor types. I've just shown a couple in the, uh, these images here. Um, up on the top left, you can see an installation with two microbiome cell tanks and a cryogenic cylinder. Uh, there's actually a total of five sensors in the picture, and I think another four out of range, all communicating through one gateway. Um, in the picture, you have two differential pressure sensors on the microbulk, monitoring the liquid level, with two uh, headspace sensor, which are high pressure sensors, monitoring the headspace, and one industrial scale monitoring the doer. Uh, so that's, that's all sitting in one, one application, and so now, the distributor and customer know, A, all the levels, when they need to conduct deliveries, not going with empty or full trucks when they don't need to go out there to visit the customer to see all that inventory, all communicating off one gateway device. Uh, the other two setups are actually doers with kind of backup or blended inventory. Uh, what you can see is kind of in the bottom left and on the right side, uh, you have kind of a doer of, of one type of gas, and then there's a backup cylinders, manifolded or just directly connected. Uh, to that sensor, or excuse me, manifolded in there to back up the doer, and then there's also other gases that are being used for applications at that particular lab, uh, all communicating with one simple um, cellular configuration. Another very common use case that we see is uh, actually a plastic scale and high pressure sensors. I was talking about it earlier. You will have like a, a beverage situation where you'll have CO2 and nitrogen. Uh, that's a very common use case, and also in medical scenarios, you often have oxygen and nitrous, which works out very well. Uh, and the sensor setup is a brief. We've made it very simple. Ultimately, the setup time consists of mostly just setting up physically the sensor, and then it usually takes five to 10 minutes in software. Actually, I wanted to take this opportunity to jump into our software. So I'm going to, one second. I'm going to jump into the software in a little bit more detail. Now, this is our demo mode. I wanted to show you something that you could actually click on and see yourself. Uh, basically, to access this, this is not some secret website. All you need to do is just Google Pulsa and click Show Demo, um, it's, or just go to uh, www.pulsasensor.com, and on the top it says View Demo, so you can very easily access this. Uh, the, this page you can see is a view of our sensor dashboard. Uh, by default, you will see all of your sensor inventory by percent rain, remaining. So you can click up here and change between percent and uh, your actual level to see uh, what inventory your, your product is at. Um, some other cool things are we recalculate your depletion time every 10 to 15 minutes. And so what, we've, what we were able to do is if you have very consistent consumption, yeah, that's easy. That's easy for anyone to calculate. But because we're taking readings every three minutes, we can recalculate when things happen and so when your consumption changes, we're gonna update your depletion time to match what is actually happening for you, uh, which is actually what's happening in the field. You can also filter uh, by any parameter you have. So let me, for example, let's say you only care about nitrogen. Uh, you can just type in nitrogen up there and you're only gonna see uh, all your nitrogen sensors that are, of course, that, that, that is part of that product. Also, you can filter by a location. So over here, we only care about things at the Yeti tap room and grill. And so you can see all your sensors. You can see uh, CO2, your beer keg, your, uh, uh, the pressure. Let's say you have nitrogen out there or some kind of beer gas blend out there. So you can see kind of the mixture there. Um, you can also sort by a variety of different options. Uh, as you can see here, sensor name, percent remaining, amount remaining, time remaining, uh, location name, and product name. 
The time remaining one is a pretty popular one, so you could see your most critical assets. And I think what's interesting is we are color coding by if you have 25% or less available, but you can sort by time because we know that 10% of inventory might last for two months or might last for two weeks. And we're able to sort for you and provide you with that actual time based on how much uh, you consumed over here. Uh, also, one of the cool things that you can do is click on the sensor window itself. I'm going to go over here and click on bulk CO2 for an example. Uh, and you get a lot more information about that sensor, the inventory, everything there. Uh, what you can do is over here you see at a glance what's your inventory level. You can switch between percent and level. Uh, and then you can see at a glance what your headspace level is at but also you, you have a full view in one graph right here. So you can see the headspace level uh, tied in with um, the actual level of product. This is relevant for uh, weight-based sensors, so you can use this on your industrial scale and you can use this on uh, your uh, differential pressure sensor. And you can also see it from much bigger range. So this is three months, this is one month, and you can see every time you've conducted a refill and you can see basically what your uh, headspace pressure was at that time. You can also see the uh, alerts. So you can set as many alerts as you want to many different users. So people often use this as a way to say, most critical or operational level this, critical check this, and set two different alerts often for that. I um, mean, you can also set different alerts for your headspace. And very importantly as well, you can set, uh, share the sensor with your customer. Uh, especially for distributors, you might have thousands of sensors in your inventory. You can pick the 10 sensors that one particular customer has share with that customer, they log into the Pulsar dashboard, they only see those 10 sensors, um, and you can set alerts for them and vice versa, depending on their use case and their, their needs. Sometimes the customer doesn't care, just says, I wanna see it. Sometimes they want alerts, sometimes they don't wanna see it at all and you don't have to share it with them. So that's the variety of different options that you have there uh, to manage it. And installing sensors is a breeze. So the one other, I wanted to show one more thing before going into sensor install, but you can actually, uh, I'm showing a weight-based sensor. So a lot of times people say, how do I pair it? So there's two options. One, you pair it on the scale, and that's going to set a new zero. Or you set the container weight here in setup, and then you test, and then basically that subtracts from the value that you read. So you're only looking at the product weight of your inventory of your sensor. Uh, let me then just show you very simply and quickly how to install a sensor. So I'm do this is actually a little bit more complicated on the web. With the app, literally you scan in the sensor. You can see a QR code that I'm showing up in the, uh, the monitor right here. You take the app, you scan it, and it will automatically populate the numbers uh, for your sensor. So all you actually need to do is just name the sensor. Uh, as you see fit, similar to all the names of the sensors that are on the screen below, hit serial sensor ID, hit serial number, and then you'll be able to uh, actually see the um, sensor added to your catalog within a couple minutes. And on that note, that is actually all I wanted to show in software in detail. Of course, more than open to have more conversation about it, but I did want to leave a few minutes open at a minimum for questions. And so you can actually, if you want to talk through a question, you can raise hands at the bottom. Uh, you can send a message in chat. And also, of course, email me at any time if, uh, you want to talk about or you're thinking about something afterwards. So on that note, I'll open up for questions and uh, any, anything that I can help out with. Jamie, do we have any questions from the group? Nothing popped up yet, just looking for raised hands. Um, yeah, we're excited to, you know, answer anything technically you guys might have for us. Um, you know, there was a lot of information covered just now, so please let us know. We've got Victor raising his hand here, so I will reach out to Victor. There you go, Victor. Your mic is allowed to talk. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask Sam a question real quick. Okay. I think I'm ready in line. Okay, I have a few questions. Well, you, you mentioned about the solar power kit. Will you uh, tell us uh, how long it lasts the lifetime of the, this panel? So, like, so Victor, the thing about the solar panel kit is that's in active development. So um, I will be able to give you information specifically about the specs once it's available and once it's ready. Uh, the, the idea is that we're designing something that can be 
Uh, you can set your gateway up outside without requiring a direct power source. Um, and then the solar panel would be able to, will, will charge up a local battery. And then so as you go through overnight and so forth, you'll be able to uh, uh, have, have access to the gateway without being next to a power outlet. Um, in terms of specs, we're still defining it because we're still piloting and designing all the hardware. Okay, understand. Well, uh, I have but another question. We expect probably the next quarter is when we're aiming to, to have it out um, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question. You, you mentioned about the, in the pressure sensor. I have a question. What about, uh, you have any restriction about flammable gases or corrosive gases can be used or yeah. limitation? Yeah, that's, that's a loaded question because there's a lot of different certifications. Um, so what you can, so a couple things. One, this is uh, 316 stainless steel. So when it comes to corrosive gases, we can't give a blanket answer on that. But we can, uh, if you have specific compounds, uh, let us know. Often, usually the people using the compounds, though, know what it's going to corrode to. So they're essentially, it's like there's a lifetime of how long stainless steel can work with some of the more corrosive gases. Uh, these sensors can be cleaned for oxygen service, so they work in those kind of environments. So that's another kind of piece there. Um, in terms of flammable gases, uh, we are working, uh, so first thing first, we're using 316 stainless steel. All of the wetted components are designed to work with flammable gases, and we have customers using it on hydrogen, which we can refer you to. Uh, but the, um, uh, in terms of specific certification, we are working on hazardous area certification. I think that's as part of the question I think Jim had in the Q&A. So we are working on hazardous area certification uh, today. Um, it is frankly a little bit slowed down because of the whole epidemic, uh, pandemic, excuse me, uh, that's going on now, but we are actually actively working on that. Uh, and we, we've designed a solution that is a very low power solution. So we're pretty confident that in the coming months, but you know, this is all a certification process that we're going through, but we are in the middle of working with Intertech to get our devices um, both both sensors uh, verified for hazardous area certification. Okay, thank you and very much. And I think, was that, was that all? Is, so yeah, there was oxygen, hazardous area, and uh, corrosive. Was there any other type of specific compound? Okay. Okay, so I, I, okay great. Like, I think that, that hopefully covers it. And I think to add to your question, Victor, because I think Jim just asked a question in Q&A Q very similar. So the certification, yes, we, we have this, you know, we're following the CJA guidelines for oxygen cleaning our sensors. Um, in terms of hazardous area, we are working on that. So the class one div one certification is active and uh, we'll definitely let you know when that's ready. Um, and we also have FCC uh, certification, CE, and I believe uh, IC, um, but the, basically the communications uh, for different Europe, Canada and US certification are all, uh, are all um, certified right now. We have that set right now. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Greg, I see you uh, I had a question. I hope you don't see me. I don't look too pretty today. <laughs> <laughs> what can we help with? Uh, the, uh, I got on late. I got tied up with an important call. Is, did you guys videotape this so I can watch this at a later date? Yep. To, so okay. everything's recorded. I'll send out to everyone registered an email with the video. You'll probably be able to get up on YouTube within a, an hour or two. I'll send it out so that you can take a look. Um, and I'll send over the slides to everybody. Last question on that. When you showed the picture and you said you could go through one link of like headspace, pressure, um, and five a few different readings, what can be... When you said one unit, is that one phone service, which is like $8 a month or whatever that dollar figure amount will give me all those different readings at the same so time? We, we, in terms of how we bill it, it's a little bit of a mix depending on the sensor that you're using and so forth. So we will build by sensor um, typically, but if you're talking about high dense areas, we do have kind of location based pricing that's a little bit different okay. uh, if there's high density in an area. Um, and also Headspace is not billed monthly or, or as a service, it's just an upfront sensor cost. So okay. it's, uh, we, depending on what you need, I can completely answer. It's, it's specific to the, um, the sensor itself. Perfect, thank you. 
Um, you're welcome. And I see Barry, you had a question about other competitors. Yes, I think we do have the uh, the best mouse trap out there. Let's, let's put it like that. Yeah, we have a few questions. So, and I think when you compare, when, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sam. When you compare us to any other vendor or anything else. Uh, in terms of the wireless connectivity, the sensor readings, the setup, those are things that we pride ourselves on. We view ourselves as a software company developing a solution that uh, making very simple, industrial, easy to use hardware. We actually, most of the time when someone asks us, can you do this? The answer is yes. And then we release new software every six weeks. So usually you'll see that within one of the upcoming releases. Um, the only thing that we push back on is saying, make my sensor hardware more complicated because that's one of our core tenets of making simple, cheap, indestructible, as much as possible hardware that you can take out in the field and you don't have to worry about. So what we've built is something, the hardware is simple, cheap, easy to use uh, so that you can install it everywhere. And we've invested all of our intelligence and capabilities in our software to make it so that we can make your supply chain the most efficient as it can be. And so we've been able to innovate in certain areas uh, like, like weight that no one else is doing, um, of course, we believe our software and our app is cutting edge and the sensors themselves are cutting edge. And so that's where we believe our stuff is significantly different than anything in the market. And it solves problems that just no one else has been aiming to solve yet. Jamie, you said there was another question. There's two more questions and then two Q&A questions. So I'm going to start off with um, Christian Card's question. He wants to know if we have anything um, with, for larger dry ice bins, 600 pounds to 1,500 pounds. So, um, so the industrial scale can work for that, but dry ice is kind of complicated because sometimes it's bigger. It's like a larger platform. Um, Christian, I can communicate with you directly. There are options of using the plastic scale and putting something on top of it, basically even out the load because the problem, it depends on what you're doing with specifically dry ice, but if every foot is basically crushing on top of a scale, the point load tends to be more than 400 pounds. But I think we can, I'll give you a call and we'll figure out if we can uh, uh, solve what your specific use case is for dry ice. Cool. Next question is from Peter Coles. He wants to know if he can group sensors as if to build a route for dispatching as building five separate reports, one for each delivery day of the week. Yeah, so um, I can, so what, we can definitely talk more about that, but there's a lot of ways that people have done that. Uh, typically, the location is a field that you set and the location is driven by the gateway. So what you can do is easily specify your route and say, hey, I've got these 50 sensors on this particular route. Let me search within my inventory for everything on that route, route A, B, whatever, route Southwest, see if anything is low and realize I don't need to do that route this week. Or let's say you have 500 sensors on a West route and you know on Monday you're going West, you can look at the 50 sensors or, or 10 sites or whatever that you need to visit when you're going west. And that's how you know what to actually visit and what not to waste time visiting. And they already have enough inventory there. So essentially that's, you, you've kind of tapped into our end game here to solve this kind of problem. Great. Um, Tony Sob Soboliski, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it right. Um, asked if you, if your liquid container or cylinders do not have wheels, I imagine you would roll the sill cart to scale and tilt cylinder onto it. Is that correct? And how do the scales hold up to that pounding? Uh, I think that's something I can answer. Oh. It, our industrial Go for it. Um, scale can definitely take a beating. It's made out of powder coated um, steel and it holds up to 8,000 pounds. So you can basically throw a lot at it and it's not gonna you know, budge for it. And it's gonna be very, very um, robust to those types of treatments in that environment. Uh, Sam, if you wanna expand on that, that that'd be great. Yep. That, that's dead on. We, we basically, that's why we did the 8,000 pound point load because we know you're going to slam 2,000 pounds on it. So we want to make sure that it can support more. So yes, um, you're able to roll it up there and get it on there very well. Cool. Jim English asked, what certifications do you have on the telemetry hardware and connectivity? So that's, I think I touched on that one earlier. We have the FCC, um, ICC, and we're working on hazardous area. And then we, we have our sensors paint for oxygen. Cool, that's what I've seen so far for questions. Anybody else have any other questions on the mind? I know we have a lot of people still attending. There must be something out there um, that somebody has a thought on or any feedback for us is even great too. Maybe I should have worn my hat to the side today. I don't know, whatever you'd like. <laughs> and yeah, we're doing, we're doing a very, um, we're trying to keep these uh, 
compact so that you can invite folks to them as well. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing one on, um, on just the business case for Pulsa and how you can build up kind of a plan to deploy our solution. And really what we think our goal is to increase profitability for the whole distribution process. So from distributors and customers, uh, reducing the truck stops, reducing the visits makes everyone's life better. And I think that's, that's where we're going with where we built a better mousetrap now. And we want to show you how that mousetrap can be used for a business game. Cool. That's all I've seen so far. If anybody else wants, you know, has a question, please raise your hand by clicking the button below um, or chat in the chat box there. I think if we don't see anything else here. We might just sign off shortly, but I'm super excited to have you all join here. And I was uh, excited for Sam to be able to present what we have today. Um, we will be hosting another one next week and we'll be sending out the invite for that. Oh, we got a chat message here. Um, can our sensors be employed on a bulk truck on the road? Live inventory. Peter Cole. Yeah, um, it basically, it depends on your power hookup in your in your truck. So as long as the gateway can go wherever you want it to go, it's just a matter of power. So as long as, and most of the trucks we've seen have uh, ability to, you know, have uh, DC power. So um, or AC, excuse me, have AC power. So as long as you can plug in your your gateway somewhere, you can have yeah, remote inventory as you're going. Cool. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. And looking forward to seeing you on the next one, my friend. Um, <laughs> appreciate the compliment earlier as well. There you go. Um, let's see here. Cool. Looks like we're good to go. Um, haven't seen any other questions pop up, but if you guys do have anything, please reach out directly. We'd love, you know, to interact with you guys and get you guys some gear. Um, we have had a major increase in orders now that people have more time to do installs and get ready for when business starts building back up. So give us a call. We'll get inventory to you quickly. And, uh, let me know if you have any questions directly. Oh, we got Jim here. Sorry. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks, Jim. We love having you here, too. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you later. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Thanks, everyone.